Well, hello, we might as well begin. We're roughly on time. Welcome, everybody. Thanks for coming to the second night of the Bathurst Multicultural Storytelling Festival. It's great to see you. And tonight, we have Professor Megan Watkins and Professor Greg Noble. And they'll be speaking initially, um, and then I'll ask them some questions, and then it'd be great to have an audience Q&A. So tonight is discussing Dr. Neralee Colvin's work based mainly around her PhD. And the festival as a whole is in Neralee's honor and memory. And it's a continuation of her vision, what she would have done, what she wanted to do, and what I promised to her. And so it's wonderful to see you here, and it's wonderful to be able to fulfill this vision. Now, this multicultural storytelling festival as a whole um, has other events, as I'm sure you all know. There's flyers outside. Um, there's also um, some contact details, if I don't already know you, that you can jot down there and I can keep you in touch for next year uh, because we would like to make this an ongoing event in, uh, in Bathurst. And tomorrow in the morning, there's the Council's Harmony Day event from 10 to 12 outside Bathurst Library. That is accompanied by an event from this festival, which is a reading uh, at 10.30 a.m. for under fives. So, you, um, you know, get on your knees if you want to get in ac access. Um, and that is um, in Chinese language with translation. And at 11 a.m. it's for five to 12 year olds, so that might be easier to fake. Um, and then, tomorrow night, Kavita Bedford, who's a graduate, is speaking here at the Ponton at 5 p.m. And Kavita is a, a specialist in multicultural storytelling. And in particular, she does that via multimedia. 11 a.m. here again on Sunday is the refugee support group. And they are having a number of speakers, including Brian, who's here tonight with his wife, Ellie. And, um, Sister Bernie and um, I believe uh, a refugee from town who is working with a support group. And then the last event is on Monday at 5 p.m., which is the Yarning Circle over at Skillset College, where um, I will talk on the themes of health, wealth and wisdom. And I'm very pleased that Wiradjuri elders will be responding with their insights and thoughts from their culture on the matters that I raise as I tell a story of <coughs> Neralee and Mai's experience for over the past two years on those themes. So that's what's uh, coming forward. I will now invite uh, Megan and Greg to have an introductory comments for, from each of them and then we'll move into the questions. So thanks very much for coming. Very very loud <laughs> voice. I used I used to be a school teacher, so the, the the children at the front of the room used to stick their fingers in their ears when I um, opened my mouth. So I, I think it was because it was loud, not because uh, for other reasons. But anyway, so um, firstly, um, we would like to acknowledge the Wiradjuri people, who are the traditional custodians of this land. Um, we'd also like to pay our respects to elders past and present, and to extend that respect to other Aboriginal people present. Um, I've actually jotted down a couple of notes here because I probably could rave on for uh, quite a while about Neralee's thesis, uh, Greg and I being um, Neralee's um, uh, PhD supervisors. So I've written down some notes and I want to um, speak to, to those and I also want to draw on some of Neralee's thesis before I then hand over to Greg. So I'd, I'd like to begin by providing a little background about Neralee's um, PhD thesis. It was undertaken as part of an Australian Research Council project with Greg and I as the, the chief investigators that was conducted with the New South Wales Department of Education and the then New South Wales Board of Studies entitled Rethinking Multiculturalism, Reassessing Multicultural Education. Narrowly took on the task of examining um, issues around each of these, 
within a regional context, examining aspects of multiculturalism and multicultural education within two high schools in a regional town in New South Wales, which for ethical purposes we don't um, uh, give a name. The title of Nerilee's thesis indicates her focus. Taking a line from the New South Wales policy on multiculturalism, diversity is regarded as a strength and an asset. She wanted to examine this in the context of these schools and their broader community, the town itself. She was interested in how today cultural diversity is promoted and celebrated when only 40 odd years ago, it was, in Nerilee's words, officially obstructed and popularly opposed. The days of the White Australia policy were not really that long ago. And of course, it still resonates today, which we are um, you know, all sadly reminded of um, given recent events, not only in New Zealand, but how they were received here and you know, one of the key people involved. Nerily was keen to trouble policies of multiculturalism, looking at how the celebratory mode of multiculturalism, what she saw as creating celebratory noise, masks continuing social inequalities and discriminatory practices. Her aim, as with the broader project, was not to critique multiculturalism with the hope of it being disbanded, but to reinvigorate it, to promote a stronger multiculturalism for 21st century Australia. Perhaps to explain this a little more clearly, I want to read um, the vignette that actually opens Nerilee's uh, thesis. So she starts off, it's a multicultural day at Seaview High, a government high school in a coastal town in New South Wales, Australia. A recent addition to the school's calendar, this is only the third year it had been held. The event has become a feature of Seaview's expanding multicultural education agenda. The day, in reality an afternoon, is designed for year eight students and involves their participation in a range of activities, fan painting, tai chi, salsa, Aboriginal ceramics, Burmese dancing, African drumming and French cooking, of course. Uh, spreadsheets listing the time and place for each activity have been pinned up in the corridors with students asked to write their names down for two of the classes on offer. First up, it's Burmese dancing. About 30 students, most of them blonde, some tan, some fair skinned, all in school uniform, stand around a space in the centre of the room while two black haired, brown skinned girls dressed in ethnic Burmese clothing hover at um, one side. As more students straggle into the room, I was told to come here, the other activities are full, a tape recorder is produced and a teacher signals that the two girls should begin dancing. They perform their dance. The students watching clap politely. The teacher remarks, it looks as if you were doing something in the fields, threshing maybe. The dancers don't understand the question or perhaps the word threshing or don't have the language or confidence to explain the meaning of the actions. The question hangs in the air. The teacher asks for volunteers to to join the dancers in the centre of the room. No one moves. Come on, she says, urging several students to copy the dancers' movements. The teacher is enthusiastic and encouraging. The students awkward and self-conscious. The dancers themselves seem more comfortable, however, relaxing into their performance and apparently enjoying their role as leaders. Down the corridor, students have gathered for African drumming, Things are quieter in the Aboriginal ceramics class. There, is, um, there the students have almost finished painting various designs, mostly dot, point, uh, dot patterns and stylized native animals on mugs and plates. The art teacher checks their progress, asks them about their designs and explain how he'll fire the pieces in the kiln. Lois, a head teacher and member of the school executive, later explains that Seaview High is going through a great change. It used to be very much a monoculture, she says, but now it's physically looking different with all our African and Middle Eastern students. She thinks multicultural events are often just top dressing stuff, promoting a view that I know about a specific culture because I've seen the national dress, 
and I can recognise their flag and I know what they eat. But adds, well, it's a start. At least we're doing something. We had nothing before. Um, sorry, I'm just picking up where I left off. So, um, her um, narrowly aim, as with the broader project, was not to critique um, uh, multiculturalism. As I said, um, where am I? I've lost my my place here. Sorry, I'll just go off what I, the point that I was going to make. Oh, that's right. Okay, so. The, the point that the, the, the teacher makes here is um, uh, at least we're, we're doing something. It's a good start. But is this the place to start? And this is the point that Nerali was making. Are such celebratory practices a problem? I know Nerali, in discussing this actual festival, was ambivalent about multicultural festivals. The point that uh, is, such celebrations may aid in strengthening community, but what understandings might they generate when the focus um, is on diversity as being about others? And with multiculturalism understood as being pretty much living apart together, which is a, is a line that is, is um, uh, given focus in the UK, and also academics make reference to that line out here. So the idea that diversity is something apart from the Anglo population. We need to ensure that equal focus is given to countering persistent discrimination and inequality. We have had over 40 years of multiculturalism, but we are still faced with the kind of racism that's been so pronounced over the last week. So we need to do more than simply celebrate diversity. But this was only one aspect of Nerali's thesis. I'll pass now to Greg to highlight other elements of her work, and we'll come back to some of these points later on in the questioning. Thanks. <clears throat> so it might seem a bit odd for us to be talking about a thesis that you haven't read, and in fact isn't even in, um, you know, available in public form. form. But yeah. it's yet, it will be. But um, for us, the questions that Nerali poses and tries to answer are in fact the questions, as Megan's indicating, uh, are questions that all Australians, in fact, everybody, should be thinking about and trying to answer. Maybe you can cover this one. A bit closer? Okay. And as uh, Megan started to suggest at the end, um, Nerali's actually very upfront about the, the fact that there's a kind of a driving moral and political question underneath her research. And that was, as Megan suggested, why, after four decades of multiculturalism, do we still have racism and discrimination in a place like Australia? And she kind of poses this question, is the kinds of celebrations of diversity that get um, uh, peddled in the name of, of multiculturalism, uh, do they challenge this racism and this discrimination or do they in fact perhaps contribute to it in bizarre ways? So to unpack that a bit, she asks a series of questions um, that I think are important for, for us to, um, to uh, enunciate and then we'll kind of pick it up in the question and answer time. The first is, what does cultural diversity actually mean? Okay, And that's quite a complicated question. But what she does is to locate it in, a, in particular places, such as rural and uh, regional towns. And she asks, what does cultural diversity mean? How is it understood by the people in a particular community where these things are turned into teaching practices and school policies and so on and so forth? So that first question, how is cultural diversity understood by people in a particular community? Secondly, and obviously related to that is, how is cultural diversity valued in those communities? Because yeah. the valuing is something that's quite um, important to the ethos of multiculturalism, but it's also important to um, the kinds of forms that it turns into, the kinds of things that people do to um, value uh, multiculturalism. Secondly, she asks, do those understandings and those values, um, how are they shaped by the school community and its particular demographics, its particular location? And, and the idea being that the way multiculturalism is, is enacted in different places depends on the kinds of places that they are. And that's very important if you're thinking about multiculturalism in a big city versus multiculturalism in a rural or regional town. 
Um, and lastly, she asks, how do, what are the consequences of those understandings and values in the sense that how, how does people understand multiculturalism shape what is done in that name? How does it shape what teachers do? How does it shape what people, like shopkeepers and police do? How does it shape how students interact with each other? So, as Megan suggested, um, narrowly tries to um, kind of trouble cultural diversity, but in a, a positive way, or in a, in a way that will generate what she calls a more robust model of multiculturalism. Because what she says that in different places at different times, what gets, what gets counted as diversity and what gets counted as valuable varies. So we need to look at particular places to see what gets counted as being diverse and what gets valued as being diverse. Um, and so one of the things that she kind of leads on to is that kind of an, an argument that it's not just about policy that we need to think about. It's, it's fine to look at policy documents and to see how they actually shape what goes on in schooling systems, but we actually need to think about what does cultural diversity mean in the lives of ordinary Australians, in ordinary places. Yeah. Um, um, and to understand the consequences of that counting and that valuing for ordinary Australians, whether they be white or black, um, migrant, non-migrant, and so on and so forth. So there are a bunch of questions that she poses for herself. Um, there are two other points that I want to make that I think are really important. Uh, Nerily is very careful about the discussion that she has around her methodology. She kind of gives us a, a, a really detailed account of her journey into the project and through the research and the way it changes as she kind of immerses herself in this town and, and gets different kinds of questions are actually being thrown at her from where, where she began. And there are a couple of really important points that come from that discussion of methodology. The one, one is the question of um, perspective. So she's, she makes this argument that um, we, we are foolish to think that we can only understand multiculturalism or any aspect of society as if there is one simple scientific view from above. That it always depends on the perspectives that we're coming from and the perspectives of the people that we're talking to. So she's upfront about the fact that she is a white middle class woman who is making her way through a rural town where she doesn't live, talking to people of all different sorts of backgrounds that are not her backgrounds. And she has to recognise her own privilege, but also her own unbelongingness to the place that she's doing her research in. So what she tries to do is to kind of use that to think about the perspectives of the people that she's talking to. <coughs> She quotes Martin Nakata, um, a well-known Indigenous um, scholar, who talks about um, we have to think when we talk about knowledge, whether it's academic knowledge or professional knowledge or whatever, what is actually known and who can know it? Okay. So she tries to give value to the things that people know about their worlds, not just privileging academic knowledge. So. Um, so the focus is for her is on a question of perspective, that there are different ways of seeing the world and there are, that we, um, a more robust model of multiculturalism needs to engage and accept and work with that fact, that there are different ways of seeing the world, different ways of thinking about the world. We can't just ignore them, we have to kind of work with them. So this question of perspective is uh, really important for the research. And she has this nice little point about how um, she talks about herself as having this kind of habitual curiosity about what people, as the creators of stories, histories, policies, programs, categories and statistics and so on, not just the existence of those stories and histories and programs and policies and so on, but what do people do with it? So to understand perspective, you actually have to also understand what do people do with the, the stories that they um, use to explain the worlds that they inhabit? Yeah. What kind of assumptions do they make and what does it allow them to do, to act in the world? Um, and the last point I want to finish with uh, is really uh, just to, to talk about narrowly and writing. Um, uh, apart from the fact that she's, she's a beautiful writer, as you will find out sometime down the track, she's also um, obsessive about words, but obsessive in a very good way. Because what she says is that the, the meanings of words are really, really important not just as a kind of an academic, arcane academic exercise in understanding, you know, uh, semantically what things are, but because uh, meanings and their uses are actually linked to what people do and how they relate to each other. Yeah. How you understand somebody in terms of being Chinese 
or black or Muslim or Australian. How you, what you understand by those things actually shapes your relations with people. And so one of the things that she does, she spends a lot of time exploring carefully what, ha what words mean and how they're used. And that contributes to her, her skills as a, as a storyteller in her own right, but also in the way she's able to kind of capture the stories and the perspectives of the people that she's working with. So I want to leave it there and pass it back over to Um, thanks very much, Megan and Greg. That was a really great introduction. I learnt some things and I remembered some things and I really enjoyed it. Um, the way you read Nerily's words was wonderful, Megan, and Nerily's writing was even better than I remembered it. That was a really great evocation of a scene and very deep and meaningful. Um, so thank you both for that. Um, how about we have a question here about this whole idea of cultural diversity that you've raised. And you say that, uh, Greg, you said that Merrily troubles the idea of cultural diversity in her research. But what's the problem? Surely cultural diversity is a good thing. Well, I don't think you want to take that one on. Uh, Great. <laughs> um, yeah, well, I... I suppose what we need to do is we need to, to make a distinction between cultural diversity and multiculturalism. I mean, this is part of the problem with discussion of, of, of cultural diversity and multiculturalism today is that people conflate the two terms. Multiculturalism can be understood as a synonym for, for cultural diversity, but multiculturalism is also a set of policies. It's a way of managing that diversity. And we actually make a, a, a point, and narrowly explores this in her, her thesis as well, that that, that distinction is really important. It's, it's important to think about it, because not every country in the world that is culturally diverse, and I mean Australia is one of the most culturally diverse, but not every country that's culturally diverse actually has policies of multiculturalism. And because we have these policies, it means that we can actually think about what they're doing. How are they managing that cultural diversity? So when, when Nerily wants to trouble cultural diversity, she actually wants to look at the, the fact that maybe the ways in which we're approaching um, multiculturalism, the ways in which we're managing that, that cultural diversity, needs to be rethought. Because over the, the 40 years of, of, of multiculturalism in Australia, there tends to have been a shift away from addressing things like um, certain kinds of inequalities, say within education, um, um, the, the hard issue of, of racism, by simply holding um, the kinds of things that she addresses in the, um, that little vignette at the beginning of her thesis, by focusing on, on a celebration of that, the, that diversity. And there is more to it. Um, in some respects, it's fine to celebrate diversity, but, but um, we also need to realise that sometimes we are actually troubled by aspects of that diversity. There are things that we don't like, that we find things unfamiliar. And if we are just going to gloss over those differences and just celebrate the diversity, we're never ever going to tackle those hard issues. It may be the case that we find, for instance, women wearing the burqa as quite confronting. It may be the case that there are other kinds of practices that, that we, we don't particularly like. Um, what we should be thinking about is the ways in which we address that, the ways in which we, we not are critical of people because of their differences, but we actually address those differences and we learn to, um, to cohabit peacefully. That we don't just react in a, in a, in a negative way, but we, we actually step back and we think. So when uh, about how we can actually uh, promote um, the kind of peaceful coexistence, which is important for the world. So when Nerilee's talking about, um, and we're also repeating it, um, troubling a notion of cultural diversity or multiculturalism. It's perhaps thinking about the ways in which we um, uh, approach cultural diversity today under policies of multiculturalism, that we need to think 
um, a little bit more about how we we live with each other and we um, deal with the, the differences that, that are evident and are becoming more ev evident in regional areas. Mm. So. And, and could you please also consider something, um, Greg, in your, in your edition, which is that I often spoke to narrowly about the policies stating things such as diversity is strength, which you mentioned. Um, is, this the, is this a part of this kind of mask, perhaps, of, you know, that everything's good in Australia? We've got this official position that diversity is strength. Therefore, we don't have to address things. And what is it that we need to address? Can we look at that a little bit more in addition to Sure, that? sure. But, um, so I want to um, pick up something that, from what Megan has said. So certainly the dominant way of talking about diversity in Australia is to kind of, is to be nice. Okay. And that's, being nice is not a bad thing, um, but as Jock has just suggested, it may in fact um, mask a whole bunch of other issues that we need to grapple with. Not just, uh, as Megan suggested, what kind of differences do we, might we have problems with? I mean, how, how t tolerant can we be of things that are very different to, um, uh, to our own lives? And, and she argues that for ordinary Australians, this is a very real anxiety. That, you know, it's not something that we should dismiss. So, but related to that, she also says, um, so what do we mean by diversity? Who is different? Okay, what do we mean when we say that there are differences here? Am I different? Or is it just certain types of people who get, get um, categorised as different? And she quotes one uh, young uh, woman who talks about how um, she's really, really different, different. Okay, as though there are kind of categories of difference, some of which count and some of which we forget about. But in the process of identifying some people as different, rather than thinking about all of us as being different in some way, we start to turn people into their differences. So this is where the kind of the masking issue becomes a problem for some forms of multiculturalism. Because what happens if you say, well, you're different, I'm not different, I'm, I'm like everybody else, but you're different. And your difference is because of your skin colour or because of the thing that you wear on your head or because of the, the language that you talk. What happens then in some forms of uh, multiculturalism, which she's, she's kind of concerned about, is, is that we actually reduce people to those differences. So people become in, um, understood only in terms of those differences. And so we actually take away the humanity from people. So, it's, so there are a couple of things that are going on. You, you're kind of taking away the humanity, hum, humanity by, ta by reducing people to the difference, differences, but also um, the niceness tends to flatten everything out. It says, look, um, your difference is quite nice. I like your food and I like you, your, your funny dances and your hats and so on and so forth. But there are relations of inequality, as Megan suggested, in, in differences. And so unless we grapple with the fact that differences are also related to social relations of power and privilege and discrimination and so on and so forth, we can never get beyond that kind of that model of niceness. And, and so niceness might actually contribute to that degree of um, you know, maintaining the inequalities that, that lie underneath those differences. Um, and I think this is um, kind of particularly important in, in places such as rural and regional towns where the understandings of cultural diversity and what it means to be different are quite different to if you live in inner city of Sydney, okay? Where um, there has been decades of, of living in a particular kind of um, uh, environment where um, uh, certain differences are, are, are valued and, and, and so on and so forth. In, in places such as the ones that, uh, the one that um, Merrily um, researched, some of those differences that people in Sydney might take for granted are still um, a problem for some people, are still a, a matter of concern and anxiety. Thank you. Uh, Let's follow up on that then and, and explore that a bit further. So cultural diversity is normally talked about in relation to big cities. And so why is it so important to talk about multiculturalism and rural towns or regional towns and cities? Um, well, I think there's a couple of things we can think about there. Uh, what is actually happening is that there are more and more people um, of a range of different backgrounds are, are settling in regional areas. And in fact, as we just heard this week, um, with uh, uh, recent migrants and um, I think with uh, refugees, that there there is now um, uh, Prime Minister um, 
uh, our Prime Minister has indicated that there uh, will be uh, people will be encouraged to settle for up to three years outside outside Sydney. So so that is is a recent push, but it's but it's also not recent that that particular move has has been around for for a considerable period of time. And so within within schools, for instance, outside Sydney, you have you have a number of regional centres that are experiencing incredible change where there has primarily been either an Anglo population or there's been Anglo and Aboriginal population, you're not now having um, waves of, of uh, migrants and refugees from, from, from Africa, from parts of Asia settling. And, and uh, this, this is something quite new. And um, uh, one of the important things that Nerali explores in her thesis is the important role that schools actually perform in ensuring that, that schools, uh, sorry, that um, uh, communities are actually well prepared. Because schools have a really important place to, um, uh, a part to play um, within communities. Uh, so many students uh, go there, their parents are there, so people intermingle, and, and it's a really important place where people can not only sort of confront difference, but learn to, you know, the, the, the term that I've used um, um, over and over, to, to cohabit, to cohabit peacefully. Um, so they, they, they play an important role. So it's, imp it's really important for us to, to realise that cultural diversity is not just um, a factor within uh, within cities, it's actually becoming more and more prevalent outside cities. And I suppose also the the, the kind of issue of engagement with um, um, uh, with Aboriginal Australians, which is something I think Greg wants to pick up on. Can I just uh, ask the audience: Is everyone hearing okay? Is Greg and Megan on mic enough and everything? Great. Yeah. So uh, to add to what Megan said. It's also the case that we live in a highly globalised world. So just because our three neighbours on either side of us um, look the same of us doesn't mean we don't live in a culturally diverse world, that we constantly kind of um, amongst differences that, uh, um, uh, that are really important to recognise. But one of the interesting things about uh, rural and regional places is that, uh, and, and Megan and I found this when, our, when we've done our own research, is that when you go there and you talk about questions of cultural diversity, people almost automatically jump to um, the uh, presence of um, another history apart from migration. So, so when people talk about multiculturalism, they are preoccupied with m migration in places like Sydney. You go to a country town and cultural diversity means something else. It means black-white relations or it means uh, a deeper underlying history of an ongoing presence of Aboriginal people in this place which somehow or other gets separated off from the question of, of, of cultural diversity when it's framed by multiculturalism. And this is a problem for multiculturalism. Um, and it's a, a, as understandably separated um, politically, but uh, we can't talk about cultural diversity only in terms of migration. And so uh, Nerali's been very brave doing what a lot of academics don't do, which is to actually talk about the cultural diversity that's related to recent migration to the cultural diversity that relates to a much longer ongoing history um, of um, Aboriginal Australia, particularly in places like um, rural Australia. Yeah, thanks for that. I mean, one of the things that I remember from reading Nerali's PhD or the thesis is, um, and, and from talking to Nerali, is that um, she discovered and was fascinated to find out that there was a hierarchy of, um, yeah. of blackness in the sense of within the indigenous community that she was researching, um, in the sense that um, there was a competition perhaps for who was the most valid um, um, black person in, in the town because of the um, migration of um, Africans to the area. Um, do you think that's a significant um, aspect of, of what Nerali found, or are yeah. there other issues around that that you wanted to um, comment on? Yeah, no, that's a particularly important one. What she talk, refers to as black versus black. And um, it's, it's a difficult issue, um, but Nerali very bravely goes there. She's quite happy to talk about it. Uh, she's not the first person to kind of come across this. There's also some research that's been done in Perth um, uh, around these issues about, about the rivalries between uh, Indigenous Australians and um, African uh, migrants and refugees. 
And uh, it's it's interesting in the way it plays out in the in um, East Haven, the place that she um, she focuses on, because partly it's about how black you are. Okay. Now, if you think about that in a place like Australia, how white you are is actually the really important thing. Okay. Um, you know, uh, we like uh, you know the way power has played out. Whiteness is a really crucial thing. Um, if you look in this room, uh, you know we are mostly white. The faces of, of the people who hold power are uh, mostly white. So whiteness counts in a place like Australia. And then we go to a, a town like East Haven, and two of the groups, the most disadvantaged groups, are actually having a fight, in a sense, about um, how black each of us are and who is the blackest. Um, and uh, it's, it's interesting because of its relationship to whiteness, but it's interesting because the relationship to whiteness is then forgotten about. Because one of the things that happens is that um, the, uh, the white people say, well, look, you see, we're actually not the problem. It's them. So you might go on about white racism, but look at them. They're fighting over who's the blackest in the town. And, um, and so, in fact, this kind of interesting point that she's making, that the, the argument about who's the blackest actually displaces the larger kind of picture about um, uh, relations between black and whites and between Australian born and non-Australian born and so on and so forth. Um, but it's one of the only many areas where she kind of, kind of focuses on, uh, on the kind of the difficult issues that um, a, a robust um, discussion around multiculturalism has to uh, engage with. But it always comes back to kind of questions about how do we understand culture, how do people use it, um, and to what extent is it understood in racial terms, to what extent is it understood in, in, in other terms and so on. Did you want to add? Yeah, I was going to say that um, uh, we also need to be really careful that um, uh, narrowly, I think, also found in her research that that, that kind of black versus black um, discrimination was to some extent overstated. Um, what she found um, in her research that in, in these schools in particular, that it was the teachers that felt that it was a problem, but when she was talking to the students, the students didn't actually identify it as a problem. So, um, so that was uh, quite an interesting finding. But, um, but, but I think, the, as Greg said, Nerali was quite brave to sort of tackle the kind of relationship between looking at Indigenous issues and looking at multiculturalism because uh, politically it's important to think of these things as quite separate and to to um, to acknowledge the 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 first um, the Abri uh, Aboriginal Australians as the uh, you know first peoples of, of this country. Um, they don't want to be collapsed into a notion of, of of multiculturalism, which which then fails to acknowledge that. But at the same time, it's really interesting about the ways in which multiculturalism has sort of led to a kind of hierarchy of difference, a kind of valorising of certain kinds of differences and blackness um, and denigrating certain others. And so Nerali did find that, that um, uh, a lot of Aboriginal Australians in the area that uh, she was conducting the research felt as though they were... Um, um, uh, marginalised in many respects when it came to discussion of multiculturalism. So this this is an area of, of ongoing interest within academe, but as, as Greg has indicated, it's also very much a kind of no-go area. How, how do you reconcile this? How do we, we approach that? And so this is one of the challenges, if you like, um, for multiculturalism about how to um, think in, in more... Um, uh, complex ways, if you like, uh, uh, about the, the the various differences that we're presented with within uh, within Australia. Oh, sorry, my <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Um, well, we we can move on to um, politics, policy, and practice, perhaps. So um, there's a suggestion that research here is not just arcane academic work, but it has political and practical consequences. Um, what are they? Okay. Um, <laughs> one of the things that Nerali would constantly say to us uh, when uh, we had our supervisory meetings is that she said, uh, I, I, w I don't want to just write this thesis 
and um, for it to be published as an academic work and very few people will read it. I want it to have an effect. I want it to, um, to change practice. And in fact, this kind of work can change practice. Uh, what is really important is the ways in which um, the work that Nerily did and, and the, the, the work that Greg and I have been doing in this, uh, the broader project, is actually being translated into professional development materials for teachers um, that then asks them to rethink their practice. Um, and in particular, the ways in which they, they deal with some of the key categories that we're talking about here. What do we actually mean by culture? What do we mean by ethnicity? Um, how are those things um, affected by processes of globalisation? What does difference now actually mean in this world? Uh, so, so those kinds of things can, um, uh, the kind of research that Nerily was undertaking, can um, be quite meaningful. And not only have they led to, you know, in baby steps really, but, but changes in, in relation to, to um, uh, teachers' practice in New South Wales schools, but there has also been some moves uh, for changes in terms of the, um, the New South Wales Department of Education's policy on, on multicultural education. So there is still a lot more work to be done, but this is the important role that, that the kind of research that Nerily was undertaking and that we've been doing as well um, can have. So I want to add a couple of things to that, um, because in fact Nerily, in the conclusion to her thesis, actually um, very thoughtfully lays out this very considered set of issues and, and, and kind of um, responses that she thinks um, um, a better multiculturalism should engage with. And, uh, and I would have loved to have put Nerily in a room with a bunch of um, 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 you know, Department of Education um, bureaucrats and, um, um, uh, and perhaps the Minister for Education. Um, I know who would have been eaten alive. But, um, but sh she quotes one of the teachers who says, look, there is no simple guaranteed answer to any of these problems. And Nerily agrees. It's actually not about getting the policy settings right, as, a, as a kind of somebody from Canberra would say, it's actually about forms of um, dialogue and, um, and uh, collaborative discussion about what the problems are and to recognise that there are different types of problems in different types of places. So, um, so one of the things that she points out is that diversity is lived differently in different places. And a multicultural policy and practice that doesn't kind of grapple with that um, and just tries to have a one-size-fits-all model won't actually get very far it actually needs to be located in particular communities yeah, um, around their concerns and needs. And she also makes the, the point that um, we need to recognise that people have very deep emotional investments in questions of identity and belonging. And it's not just a kind of abstract policy um, um, discourse that matters. It's um, uh, both people who are migrants or um, Indigenous Australians, but also white Australians have a very emotional deep attachment to what they think it means to be who they are. And we can't simply um, ride over that with, um, we, we can't do that because you're racist or you shouldn't do that, you should think this, blah, blah, blah. Uh, uh, thirdly, she talks about the need to have a different way of thinking about um, questions of cultural diversity. Um, and to, to accept, as I said um, earlier on, that there are different ways of thinking and that we need to kind of put those different ways of thinking together um, to kind of um, engage in a particular kind of dialogue um, uh, going forward, as the politicians like to say. Thanks so much for that. It's uh, really helped to give me a deeper understanding of Nerily's work, despite obviously, you know, me having talked about it with Nerily for so many years and reading her thesis. But this is, this is really kind of um, expanding and, and reflecting on that um, in a wonderful way. Um, perhaps it's time to see if anybody in the audience has any questions um, and uh, I can bring the microphone over so that the questions are captured on the recording. Thanks Nick. Hi I'm Nicola. Um, I'm not quite sure how to frame if it's a question or if it's just some thinking on it. I'm so I'm a psychologist, so I've noticed. I, I think a lot of what we're talking about is lens and how we see things, and I'm noticing that 
I see my work um, through a small scale lens because I work clinically in psychotherapy. And so I'm just conscious of how, um, well, so, so then I'm thinking through the question of diversity and thinking it's interesting that in a process of, of, of say, me working with a new client, I'm conscious that I'm, um, I'm, I'm conscious that I'm actually always meeting a person from a position of otherness. I don't actually yet know that person, though, though uh, assumptions may be made that uh, around similarities, but in fact, the more I, I work with someone and, and try to understand the nuances of what it means to be that person, the more I'm, you know, I'm trying to understand something that is about otherness. And so it makes me think about this question of diversity anyway, because in fact, like, I feel like we're all incredibly diverse and there's this thing of somehow when we're talking about cultural diversity that we're putting, um, I don't know, perhaps what you're talking about earlier, that labels on particular things which make us diverse, which are perhaps more obvious and, and, and perhaps it's got something to do with where the power sits. And also there's this, that, that other really important point that you just made at the end about the emo all of our emotional investment in who we think we are, at, at least, and um, and a lot of that probably operates at an unconscious level. Yeah, so I'm not sure if it's a question, it's just a, a thought. As I say. Yeah, well, I just, um, uh, you know, th this is one of the, the issues with multiculturalism, that, that um, what it tends to do is it focuses on particular differences. I mean, one of the um, it, w it was really interesting as part of the broader project that we spoke to a, a lot of students. So we spoke to students in primary schools and we spoke to students in, in high schools. We also spoke to parents and teachers. But some of the, the most insightful comments were actually made by, by some of the students we were dealing with. And I just, it makes me, uh, your comments make me actually think of, of one particular um, student of, a, of an Anglo background but in a highly diverse school. And um, we, were, we were just talking about multicultural education. We were talking about differences. And she just sort of paused and she said, um, well, everybody's different. She said, everybody's different. But the trouble with multiculturalism is we just focus on a particular type of difference. We foreground ethnicity. But we also need to think of the other elements that make up, you know, make up somebody's sense of identity. We, we need to think about gender, we need to think about sexuality, we need to, I mean, she didn't express it in these terms, but this is basically what she was talking about. Um, we need to think about class, we need to think about all those things. And it's not the fact that um, we then deny um, cultural and, and ethnic difference. It's not about that, but it's the ways in which we deal with it. As Greg says, what happens is we often reduce people to those ethno-cultural differences. Um, what we were discussing um, very um, in, the, in the kind of training that um, Nerily participated in as well with teachers um, as part of this project is we discussed this idea of cultural essentialism that we, we have this, we draw out one particular element of somebody in th and that may be their, their assumed ethnic background and then we, we, make, um, we make assumptions about that. We assume that their, their behaviour, what they do, is determined by their ethnicity. And we would always sort of throw that, um, those kinds of ideas back at teachers and say, OK, so, so you might say that Chinese behave in this particular way, or you may say that um, you know, the um, uh, you know, Muslim, as, uh, the people who are Muslim behave in a, in, in a particular way. What about if I said, oh, Anglos, Anglos behave in a particular way? And they'd sort of s sit back and they'd well, that's stupid. Well, of course it's stupid because not everybody who belongs to a particular kind of ethno-cultural or national category actually behaves in the same way. There's a whole multitude of factors that influence who we are and what we do. And, and this is one of the things that is often, is often um, forgotten, I suppose, in multiculturalism with, with such a kind of focus on the idea that diversity is a strength and it's an asset we then forget about other elements of, of people's identity. 
and we get the kind of troubling situation which confronts us all the time uh, about um, you know the the foregrounding of identity politics and just putting an emphasis on on ethnicity and th this is a worry yeah just to elaborate a couple of things is so i think it's really important for professionals to recognize that when they're dealing pe with people who are other to them that they are also other okay and and uh, um it's, it's one of the things that nearly does in the thesis is to recognize her otherness in a sense so um and because we're professionals and we think we're scientific and it's just about the facts or whatever we actually forget that our worldview is just one worldview among many it may be a better worldview for some things but it's not a better worldview for other things so it's about recognizing our own otherness okay uh, secondly um there's a really tricky ethical problem in all this um, which is that I would argue that the, the deep ethos of multiculturalism is to actually say, okay, what we have to do is to um, address people in the mode that they want to be addressed in. You know, how, you know, what identity do you want to be recognised as? That's really important. But the problem is, as Megan suggested, we have 47 of them, where you might have 83 or whatever. And sometimes I want, might want to be addressed as a man, sometimes I might want to be addressed as a, an Australian, or sometimes I might, might, might want to be addressed as a you know a rock music fan or whatever so the tricky thing in dealing with people is that um, that you have to kind of read how do people want to be talked to when when you're engaging with them um, and so th the first question to ask may not be where are you from because that immediately takes them to a particular kind of category um, because you know talking to people they might you know a woman in a bus might actually see herself more in terms of being a, mo a mother than a Muslim okay so Interaction becomes very, very tricky because we actually have to learn how how ethically can we behave when when people move between these different kinds of identities. But the thing is that it's also tricky because um, as uh, as academics, as one form of professionalism, we also want to analyse the world uh, in particular ways and start to impose categories that we think are good ways of explaining the world, which may not be the ways that people have of explaining their worlds to themselves. And you can't actually resolve that, okay? So, um, and uh, our reading Nerali's thesis was actually, uh, again, it was, quite, it was quite nice to see how that, she doesn't quite articulate it that way, but it's, a, it's an unresolvable tension, okay? This kind of ethical dilemma of, about how to work out how to talk to people if they are other to us. Can I just add something to that? Because I thought you were going to, to go off on the the, um, uh, the the academic angle and 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 reference a per, a particular sociologist to made me think of. Um, there's a, a famous um, U.S. sociologist called Rogers Brubaker, and he has this really nice little um, phrase where he refers to ethnicity without groups. And what he actually means by that is an acknowledgement of of somebody's sort of ethnic difference. But you don't necessarily group everybody together it, um, in the same way that other aspects of identity, you don't automatically group necessarily all women together, um, all heterosexuals together, or Christians together, or whatever, that we actually acknowledge that there, there are differences. And once you, once you do that, it actually makes you think about um, cultural diversity differently. And hopefully that's something that would influence the ways in which we can rethink multiculturalism. Thank you. And um, what you were talking about just reminded me of um, my master's uh, major work, a film about Indigenous education or about education in schools, talking about um, in Indigenous Australia. And the title of that was The View from the Shore, which was taken from the teacher's own practice of and, and the curriculum's idea that the student should see um, history from the perspective of Indigenous people. So a very um, worthy and insightful perspective, I think. And, and that's, it seems to me, a part of the key insight that we can take from, from these points is that our perspective, say, for example, on this stage, um, as, as, as white Australians, or perhaps I would consider myself an Anglo, the, the Anglo perspective is seen as normal in Australia. Maybe not in other places, certainly not. But 
um, this sort of normalising of the Anglo perspective seems to be a big part of the problem uh, because everything else is the other, everything else is different. More questions? Uh, thank you. Thank you very much to both of you um, for coming here tonight and sharing this thesis and, and all the very interesting ideas. Um, I really like the way you distinguish between um, promoting multiculturalism, promoting diversity, and from promoting peaceful coexistence. And my question really is, um, does, does Nerali's thesis sort of address, articulate and, and address that, that idea? Does your, does your research address that idea? Do, do, you, do, you feel that, um, do you feel that coexistence is possibly a, a, more, a more valuable, or is, it a, is it a valuable alternative focus, if you like? Uh, no, it's a really good question, a really good question. And there is, no, I don't have a simple answer to it. Um, where nearly ends the thesis, though, is, is kind of really interesting because she kind of says, um, uh, this is paraphrasing, it's not really what she says, but it, it, the message is something like this. In fact, uh, the only way to move towards peaceful coexistence is to recognise that there won't be any peaceful coexistence. In other words, she kind of makes this argument that once you recognise that there are different perspectives and that there are different ways of thinking about the world, there are different values, the point is not to kind of um, hope for or impose some kind of simple model of social harmony, okay? It's actually about um, working out ways of negotiating those differences, okay? Which is, which is um, but different to the, the kind of model of peaceful coexistence that you might get peddled by, you know, politicians and so on. It's actually a kind of a accept the fact that we are, there are going to be tensions that there are going to be difficulties and misunderstandings and misrecognitions. And um, sometimes I won't know what you're talking about and sometimes I won't agree with you. But we have to have a kind of a, a manner of approaching those things which is not um, uh, aggressive or belligerent or conflictual. It, you know, it, it reminds me of um, the argument about democracy, which is that we think of democracy as this kind of lovely consensual model that we can just kind of, um, if we all pool our, our, um, our, our efforts, we will end up with a beautiful system. But in fact, democracy is deeply um, conflictual in that sense. It's all about arguing things through and, and working out how you actually um, can resolve the fact that you believe in this and I believe in that. And Nerali's kind of uh, argument in the end is really about the ways that we can do those, the management and the negotiation of those form, those tensions in a productive and um, collegial or, or you know, however you want to call it. And I would say that that's actually kind of a, a deep, critical understanding of peaceful coexistence rather than a, a happy, chappy kind of peaceful coexistence. And she has this, she has this nice quote um, uh, which she uses from a science writer, a guy called Lewis Thomas. And she says, uh, and it's part of the, this importance about kind of um, sharing our stories. Um, she says, we uh, the quote is, we pass the word around we, pass, we ponder how the case is put by different people, we read the poetry, we meditate over the literature, we play the music, we change our minds, we reach an understanding. Okay? So it's not about agreeing or, uh, or a consensus or coming to the same shared values, it's about coming to an understanding. And I think that's probably a more productive way of thinking about this thing called coexistence. Is it also about the dialectic? Uh, it's, it's certainly dialogic. You know, so it's, it's about putting those stories up against each other and seeing how they work. You know, it's not as though we can kind of turn them all into one long narrative where everybody fits, which is what some versions of multiculturalism have tried to do, to tell a story where everybody has their place. Sometimes it's about, you know, the, the indigenous story of Australia is quite different to the, the, um, the story of Australia as told by the white victors. So what do we do with that dissonance? Do we try and turn it into a story? Um, which fits everybody in, I don't think we can, uh, because it takes us to um, very difficult questions about, about relations between blacks and whites and victors and, and, and losers and so on and so forth. But we can't avoid that. That's the story of Australia. So. Well, you mentioned democracy. Megan, did you want to oh, no, add mean, something? I just, when Greg was talking about you know, the, the 
who, you know, who are we? That the other um, aspect of cultural diversity that we haven't really touched on is is the the the, the kind of diversification of diversity that that you know through intermarriage and cultural adaptation, we we're, we're not a single ethnicity anymore anyway. I mean, this is the the thing that was was really interesting um, from uh, a big survey that we did actually with teachers that that people um, identify in a range of different ways. And it's not just um, hyphenated identities where you might say I'm Chinese Australian or I'm Australian Lebanese or whatever it happens to be. That there's, there's actually additional kinds of connections that sometimes you know people refer to three different um, uh, heritages or four different heritages. And so, so you know, what, what are you? <laughs> so the you're most, a person. The most telling one. Interrupt. The most telling one was the person who said, "Well, I'm. Um, I think it was this. I'm. Uh, I'm Chinese Australian with Fiji and um, Irish and Indigenous background." Okay. So, you know, I feel like saying to them, "Well, how am I supposed to talk to you? You know, what are you?" And of course, of course, it's a silly question to ask because we are many, many things, and we live in a, in a place. Uh, Australia has kind of grappled with this problem earlier and in more, more deeply in some ways than other countries because we have had such a long history of migration. And, you know, intermarriage in Australia is probably probably the highest in the world. If it's very hard to kind of measure these things. But it means that you have this kind of proliferation of hyphens upon hyphens upon hyphens. Well, I think that was one. It didn't, um, uh, it didn't narrowly um, coin that term, the um, um, hyphen nation. I don't know if that was hers or she got it from somewhere else, but I remember yeah, she was talking about that. let's look into that. Maybe that, we can so. build on it. Yeah. Mm, mm. Um, well, you mentioned democracy, and um, I love democracy, and as Donald Trump might say, uh, nobody loves democracy more than me. Um, but Benjamin Franklin um, defined democracy as two wolves and a lamb arguing over what to have for lunch, which seems pertinent. Um, Andrew? Uh, thanks very much and uh, very interesting to hear um, more detail on Marilee's work. I, I wanted to ask about whether she arrived at a view that multiculturalism may be possible to rebuild from the bottom up um, and whether that's sort of conceptually possible given that it was something that um, it was something that white Australia extended to migrants. And that's where I think we've got the confusion with Indigenous people because it was something, it was something specifically yeah. Yeah. that white people did um, to try to make uh, migrants more welcome. It, w it grew out of migrants um, not staying here for, you know, in terms of our understanding of wh why were they leaving? Oh, we'll have to do something to make them more welcome. Can it become more generalised? Can and can it be rebuilt, you know, from the bottom up? Yeah. Well, I, I mean, I, I think we had sort of a, a number of those those kinds of, of um, conversations. I mean, there there are often moves, and in fact, we've seen it in in Australia in the you know the the last sort of um, I don't know 15 to 20 years, where with multiculturalism out of favour, people have have talked about, okay, well, you know, that's that's passe, let's move on to something else. But I do actually think that, that multiculturalism has a certain kind of currency. And despite the fact that we might critique it, I think that there are quite valuable elements of it. Um, but there are these issues. Um, yes, it was something that sort of white Australia introduced, if you like, um, and it wasn't just because um, migrants were leaving, it was because uh, the, the policies, policies of assimilation and integration just didn't work because people did retain um, their religion, they did retain their language, they did retain their customs. So, so it was a kind of, okay, well, we need to accept this and embrace it and, you know, we, we, we have to work with it. Um, so uh, I think it's, it's about thinking how we can make those changes. And Nerily was a great believer in, in the ways in which you can, um, you can use writing to have an effect. 
and the kind of effect that she was talking about was particularly in relation to schools. I mean, she was very interested in, in changing practice and getting, and getting teachers and students to, to rethink the ways in which they, um, they approach these issues. And I think that, you know, education has a really powerful role to play. Um, if we can see these kinds of changes happening at schools and children having different kinds of understandings around um, what multiculturalism might mean, um, then that can, that can encourage different kinds of practices. And so I think that, I don't think it's just an ideal, I think that it's, it's something that we work towards. But in working towards, we have to think about the value of critique, not as something that is just about, you know, um, dis as I said, um, uh, discounting multiculturalism, but realising that, that it can have a productive role. How do we, how do we modify it to make it, um, uh, to, to make it more inclusive? And that, um, you know, something that, that we talk about in the, in the broader, uh, uh, the broader project. It's not just about kind of cultural recognition. I think this was um, something that grew out of um, some of Greg's earlier work. It's about a kind of cultural acknowledgement that we're, we're actually acknowledged in um, all aspects of people's humanity. And that becomes important, not just foregrounding sort of certain, certain elements, because that's what creates, that can create a problem. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I'd, I'd be very careful about seeing multiculturalism as a gift from the powerful to the powerless. Um, uh, in fact, I'd argue that it, it, it wasn't just a kind of a, a cynical exercise to keep migrants here, um, because uh, many migrants themselves were getting involved in various forms of activism and, and, and making demands, or in fact, organising stuff themselves. So we, sometimes the story of multiculturalism forgets the fact that um, many migrant groups organise their own associations to, to organise things like housing and welfare and um, employment seeking. And, uh, um, and um, there is a particular story of multiculturalism told by one historian which implies it's just a, a um, made up by elites. But in, it's a much more complicated um, issue than that. And the same thing with indigenous policy. It's not simply something that whites have given um, or imposed upon um, uh, Aboriginal Australians. It's, both things are always a matter of um, kind of uh, negotiation, um, conflict uh, and compromise. But your ability to get the, the version that you want is actually shaped by your, your position of power. Um, so the, the multiculturalism and, and Indigenous policy are both kinds of outcomes of negotiation um, that favour the, the people who have most power. So I tell I say that because I don't want I don't want uh, I want to, to kind of emphasise that it's always been a process of negotiation. That it's quite it's important to recognise that these things are always negotiated. But we need to kind of um, uh, I don't want, I don't want to say it sound like a, too much of a right on activist, but it's it mobilising from below is you know is one way of putting it. But it, to recognise that. Um, more needs to be done at a local level uh, to, to talk about the forms of cultural diversity that exist there and how they can translate into, into um, things like educational practice. Um, it, it's not, and it's not just a, a flat dialogue that happens at this level. I think it's really important to recognise that there needs to be a dialogue between ordinary Australia, whatever that is, and policy makers. Because policy makers make policy often um, without any interest in what um, ordinary people say or do, uh, e except insofar as it gives the people in power an electoral advantage. Um, and it's, it's kind of a nice but sad thing to note that um, Neroli's thesis ends with a postscript because the, um, just as she's finishing it off, uh, the Australian government comes out with its latest multicultural policy, which doesn't mention multiculturalism. Well, it's not really a policy. It's a statement. It's a statement. <laughs> And she just kind of throws her hands up in the air in this postscript and says, oh, jeez, this is hopeless. But in a nice kind of way, without sounding too pessimistic. I mean, can I just add to that, because I thought you were going to pick up on the, um, the term uh, of everyday multiculturalism, um, which, you know, Greg's done quite a bit of work in. And um, 
Uh, but even using that term, I, I think it, it is still important to remember that um, multiculturalism is actually a set of policies. And because it's a set of policies, it's something that, that it can change. When we're talking about everyday multiculturalism, it's, it's influenced by those policies, but it's also getting back to just a notion of cultural diversity and, and how, how is it that people live um, multiculturalism? Um, and, and people do it every day and a lot of people do it very well. And so while there may be antagonisms and every so often there are kind of crests where there are you know, horrific things that happen, um, on a day-to-day -day basis, people tend to do it pretty well. Um, and so not that you want to sort of romanticise it, but um, we need to think about those practices, how they do work. And maybe it's that kind of um, bottom up that needs to be um, impacting the ways in which policy makers think about multiculturalism. Yeah. Um, thank you, Megan and Greg, for offering your insights in multiculturalism and also sharing with us um, Dr. Merrily Kelvin's thesis. Um, my name is Miao, I'm from China. I think I have to say something because I heard the word Chinese mentioned at least three times in the conversation. And also because it's a multicultural storytelling festival. And looking at the, looking around the room, I think I'm contributing a lot <laughs> in <laughs> making it multicultural. So I'm, I'm representing the, the multi part. Um, <laughs> So I wish to just share some of my stories. I came to Australia roughly um, 2008, the, the 27th of February. I came here to do my PhD. And after I arrived, I think multiculturalism was exposed to me. I have never seen this many people from so many different countries. Um, so in the PhD office, there were students from Brazil, from Iran, from Vietnam, and, and many other countries. And then um, I came to Bathurst in two, 2015, uh, three, roughly three and a half years ago. I was also um, noticing that in my office, we have Iranian, we have uh, Sri Lankan. Um, but the difference is when I was um, first came to Australia uh, to the Gold Coast. There were so many people, um, so many people from overseas. But in Bathurst, um, not many. For example, the Chinese community, we probably have roughly 30 or 40 Chinese people. And last weekend, I went to an Iranian um, talk. They were talking about their culture. And it was roughly five or six households in, in Bathurst. Um, I wanted to share more a story about my friend. Um, when I came to Australia, um, I have never felt I'm different because there are so many people from different countries. I think I'm just one of them that making me feel I'm not different. And I've never felt that uh, I was dis discriminated or against. Um, I think Australian people are lovely. <laughs> and uh, especially I came, to uh, I came to Bathurst, I find the people from this part of the country is even more lovely and warm because I think it's the a small community, the countryside of people. Um, but then um, I did learn from one of my friends. She has been in Australia for 10 years and she just came to by first straight away. And she said, she told me, and I was shocked by her story, she told me that she had been bullied by local people um, for 10 years at her workplace. Um, she said she came to work and she felt black clouds over her head. She felt so stressed and depressed. She had to run to a psychologist for help. Um, and she was asking me whether I have this experience and I, I told her, not really. And we were talking about the situation. We were thinking m maybe it's because um, maybe because I'm surrounded by people probably a bit more educated and she was probably surrounded by people not as educated. And I was thinking whether the people, how the multiculturalism is manifested in a way 
that is different due to the community, um, the nature of the community. For example, the level of edu education, the level of people's experience. For example, people who experience, who travel a lot, may accept people from other cultures more. Um, maybe it's related to people's profession. Um, I'm an engineer and I, I'm not very sensitive in terms of whether I was being discriminated or not. Um, I don't know whether, <laughs> whether those other factors will affect people's understanding and acceptance of multiculturalism. Thanks. Yeah, no, that's a, uh, that's a good point. Um, I don't need to tell you about Bathurst. I'm sure you do uh, talk about Bathurst amongst yourselves. But um, I want to make a, um, a, a, an interesting point because I do a lot of research with, um, with uh, migrants, and particularly um, Lebanese background migrants. And I want to tell you kind of three different kind of anecdotes which just don't sit together, which helps explain, you know, people have different experiences. So, you know, uh, one woman I interviewed a few years ago um, uh, talked about, uh, that all, all the migrants that I've ever spoken to talk about, when they come to Australia, they are gobsmacked, they're kind of surprised by how culturally diverse Australia is, because they kind of came here thinking Australia was just a kind of little England, okay? So they're shocked, in, but then they're shocked in a good way. And uh, so this one woman I spoke to kind of talked about how she loved the diversity in Australia. And she, she didn't want to live in a white area, and she didn't want to live in, an, in what she called an Arab area. She wanted to live in an area which was just lots of different people. Okay. So in the same bunch of interviews, though, um, I would also talk to uh, a man who kind of said, you know, I really like cultural diversity here. We've got, um, um, you know, it's great that uh, people have, like me have been able to come here and so on and so forth, but we've got too many Chinese, too many Asians. So, um, uh, so it, he was kind of saying it's certain types of migrants he wants Australia to have and not others. Um, and that's not an uncommon thing. Um, so, and the third one, which again doesn't kind of connect in a direct way, uh, is a comment that I've heard from a few uh, migrants who say something like, Australians are really nice to you. They, they kind of say hello to you in the street. So it's all very pleasant, but they never invite you inside their house. Okay? And I was talking about this with someone a couple of years ago who kind of, who kind of pointed out that there's a kind of a class difference in the way multiculturalism has lived. So yes, to some extent I'd agree with you that um, greater education um, uh, correlates with a greater commitment to multiculturalism. Um, so middle class people like me kind of say, you know, the right things about people who are different to them. Um, and we, we travel the world and we eat at lots of different restaurants. Um, but, um, but this person was saying that it's a, it's a very kind of um, a superficial niceness. It's not the, it's not the, the niceness of a deep community. Um, and, um, and this is in contrast to some research that somebody else has done um, in the working class community, which can be quite brutal and quite um, uh, brutal in its language about people who are different. And yet, the argument is that as a community, people are much more likely to, to muck in and, and, and work, live together as a community. So there are quite complicated things about social class that happen in people's understandings and, and use of multiculturalism. But it's an interesting question. That's a question. Did, next question. Yeah, no, I was thinking about something better. But <laughs> okay. Well, a couple of things remind me of um, Hugh Mackay's book, The Art of Belonging. Uh, I think it's The Art, a recent book. And he talks about a, a community there. Um, I think it was, sounded like a very working class community. And a Vietnamese couple had a big problem with a, a child that died. And this long story that he gave at the beginning of the book was about how that community rallied around their neighbours, the, the Vietnamese um, immigrants. And, you know, they came around to them, they supported them, and they were really very present for them for a long time. And um, maybe that is like a, a sort of a case study that sort of mm. demonstrates your point a bit. I will say something. The reason why I hesitated is because um, when Greg was talking, I was actually thinking of my mother. <laughs> and um, she's from country New South Wales. And um, she's um, in her 90s now. And um, I would 
probably put her in the category of, you know, um, not even borderline races, <laughs> probably. Yeah. But what's been really interesting, um, now my stepfather has passed away, she's actually um, making um, quite a lot of use of community aid. And there are a number of people from a whole range of different backgrounds that work in community aid. So my mother is now interacting with people who are Indian, quite a few, um, who actually used to work in a news agency and she always used to say, oh, those Indians, they're so arrogant. Now, she hasn't said that recently. Um, <laughs> and um, she's also been driven around by a number of uh, people of, of Chinese background. Um, uh, another person is Japanese. Um, and it's really interesting. And so when you were talking, I, I, I was just starting to think about the, the kind of everyday nature of multiculturalism and how poor, important that can be where, where um, sometimes those differences become problematic. But there are also these important processes whereby when you're dealing with people on a day-to-day -day basis, you actually get to know people, you actually realise that actually they're not that different after all, or we actually have quite a bit in common. Um, and sort of just to get back to, um, you know, the topic of Nerali's thesis around schools, this is why schools are so important. They bring people together. Um, but it's also uh, something important about the nature of our, and in particular, public schools, that we do need to encourage um, uh, quite a lot of diversity. I mean, there are problems with schools now, um, with changes in, you know, with selective schooling and so forth, where we tend to have concentrations of different groups of students, and that can, that can create problems. Um, I mean, that's another issue, um, but, uh, but we do go into, um, but we do need to think about the, the value of those everyday kinds of relations and the ways in which they can promote understanding. Um, my mother's a perfect example, you're never too old to, <laughs> to learn. <laughs> Um, I might um, um, call it to a to a close there. Did you have a quick question? Yeah, um, just a statement. Maybe your mother, your stepfather, had a lovely insight. Maybe she could have been influenced. Sometimes, when you have a partner, either the male or female, can have a great influence on the other partner. Oh, I think they can, but I think it was. Um, um, uh, oh, I, think it was <laughs> I think it was all of my own. <laughs> I'm not. I'm not. I'm not going to let my mother off in that but way. It's no, really no, no. Good <laughs> that she got out and needed those things because then she was able to see that. Yeah, people well, from you know, she's yep, yeah, she's engaged yeah. with a whole range of people. <laughs> I'm yeah, well, you used to use her as a, a, um, a case study, wasn't it, in a lot of your lectures? <laughs> the complexities of racism, how somebody can say awful things about one person at one moment and then be incredibly nice the next. <laughs> it is complex, and is I think complex, one of the yeah. things we're going to pick up with Brian on Sunday morning at 11 is talking about how um, Australians might, some of some Australians might be um, racist um, at first blanche, and then when they get to know somebody, they're not. That's that's sort of the opposite in a way. And and um, and I'm glad, Mia, that you've had a positive experience. And sorry to hear about your friend's one. I have a colleague who is overseas, but he he works with us. He's Bangladeshi, and he mentioned to me four incidents of random um, confronting racism by strangers in the street and in the shopping centres in Bathurst. Um, he's um, so he's got brown skin. It's possible one of them was it was on race, race week and they could have been from Sydney and possible not, possible not. But um, nevertheless, um, I'm pretty old. I, 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 I have never been confronted by people on the street um, and told anything really. Um, and so I just thought I'd sort of add his voice because he did really want to be here. Um, and, and that was his experience to the extent that he um, stopped going out at night. So this introduced um, fear in, into, um, into his life. And, um, you know, case studies or single examples or anecdotal things don't really tell you much, but they, you know, it's, it's a part of the equation. Um, I'd just like to thank everybody for being here, for your contributions, your questions, your very attentive listening, um, and um, Brendan for your um, technical support. And 
Greg and Megan. Thank you so much for all of your thoughts. Yeah. Well, indeed, and, and Megan mentioned Nerily, and I think it, I feel gratitude for Nerily's effort for working so hard to tackle with such, uh, um, you know, intellectual vigour this really important topic. And, you know, we really value um, your support in that effort and now an even deeper um, appreciation of Nerily's work and, and, and an appreciation of your work. So, um, Greg and Megan, thank you. And I'll say good night and um, thanks all for coming and thanks again to the both of you.